A 53-year-old male who has a child is erotic with portal hypertension. He had intermittent episodes of melina. And uh, this is the endoscopic image. So the plan is to do an US coiling glue. Over to you, sir. No? Oh, okay. Great. okay, fantastic. Great. So I just introduced the echoendoscope and... Um, now I'm using a scope that I don't use in my unit. So uh, things are a little different. This is a Fuji scope. It's the EG58 OUT, has beautiful optics I'm noticing. It is a 3.8 channel, so it's a large channel, which we really don't need. So the large channel you'll need, for example, when you place the lambs, uh, it has a very thick sheath. But for this procedure, you don't need a large channel. So I usually just use the standard diagnostic curved linear ray echoendoscope. But you'll see then with the endoscopic view, which I assume you have, beautiful uh, optics. And it's always, and I'm just going to repeat this over and over again, endoscopic ultrasound. It starts with the endoscopy, but we can do everything today with one scope. You don't need to put a gastroscope down first. So you see the uh, distal esophagus, and we just want to make sure that there aren't any large varices here in the esophagus because we're doing a transesophageal, ideally transcrural access to the gastric fundal varices. So we want to know whether there are large varices in the distal esophagus. All right, so now we're just going to carefully advance across the GE junction. With the Fuji scope, you'll notice that you actually see the tip of the transducer ahead of you which you don't with the Olympus. I, in the beginning, I was a little puzzled what that, what that was that I was seeing, but that's the tip of the transducer. A beautiful view of the stomach, and you'll see that there actually, if you only looked at this, you would say, there are no gastric varices, looks fine. A little bit of portal hypertensive gastropathy maybe, but otherwise looks fine. So you can do your whole examination with this. Because of time, I'm not going to do a complete endoscopic ultrasound, but I normally always do, starting with the biliary system, pancreatic head, et cetera. That's important information that you need in a patient with gastric varices. But I'm not going to do this today. I just want to show you very quickly, because of time, just sort of the key points, how to get quick access to visualize gastric fundal varices um, with endoscopic ultrasound. Now, one of the things you can do with the echoendoscope is go into retroflexion and see the fundus. So I'm going to show you that now. You just have to insufflate a lot of gas, but you can see here that I can visualize. You can see it at the very top next to the scope. There are large gastric fundal varices, right? And you should look to see whether there are any stigmata of recent bleeding. Are there any red whale signs? a white nipple sign, something like that. And uh, it doesn't look like there are. Uh, has this patient bled from varices in the past? No. No. So this is prophylactic, yeah. but we have good data to justify prophylactic treatment of large gastric fundal varices. But again, you see a beautiful view endoscopically of these gastric fundal varices. All right. So now we got to suck out the gas because air or gas is our enemy with ultrasound. We then orient the tip of the scope towards the fundus, which is to the left like this. And now you can see I have a water pump attached to the biopsy channel. Now for the echoendoscope, unless you have a forward view echoendoscope, the Olympus one has a water jet channel, but the echoendoscopes do not have a water jet channel. So you need to attach a, um, something that allows you to preserve your biopsy port and, and and do irrigation. In this case, I have only irrigation, So, but the BioShield, I think it's U.S. endoscopy, allows you to have a cap. You can insert instruments, and alongside your instrument, you can also infuse water. So let's now fill the fundus with water. Water is our friend, and it's important to get good filling. So now I want you to switch to the ultrasound view, please. So are you seeing the ultrasound? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't know what the, uh, very good. Okay, so now I'm going to step on the pedal 
And this is the most important part. And by the way, I just have to mention, this patient is not intubated. I'm okay with it. I discuss it with the anesthesiologist. They feel very comfortable. But I intubate my patients when I do this. Firstly, because I'm putting a lot of water in the stomach. But second, who knows? Maybe there could be massive bleeding. And then I would want the patient tubed to protect from aspiration of blood and maybe hemodynamic instability and so forth. So think about maybe intubating and doing this under general, but we're doing it under MAC anesthesia today. So now I'm filling up the lumen and you can see the little fish in the lake now, there's a little, some bubbles here and I'm pulling back and there's that big gastric barracks. You can see it nice. And what you want is to really see the outline. You need to differentiate varices from collaterals. Varices are intramural. Collaterals are extramural. So we don't want to be putting glue and coils into the extra into the collaterals. We're wanting to look ideally for the feeder vessel, but we definitely don't want to be putting them, for example, in a big gastrorenal shunt per se. All right, so this allows you to see the outline of the mucosa and you see beautifully the varices here. And what may look to you when you look endoscopically as one big varix actually may be a convolute of smaller varices that interconnect. And that's exactly what you see here. This is a whole convolute of varices. And so this is why even though you could target this with a gastric approach from the cardia, I prefer to pull back into the esophagus and grow transesophageal from the backside. And I like to use the cruce muscle as a backboard to prevent any back bleeding. So it just stabilizes everything and it ensures that I'm not going to get torrential bleeding, which can occur if you go from the gastric side, right? From the mucosal side, because the mucosa is thinned out. You puncture that, it's under a high pressure, and it can suddenly just start bleeding torrentially on you. So you need to be prepared for that. Now, how do you find the feeder vessel? Well, there's a little trick. And the trick is to see, find the cruce muscle. And you see the cruce muscle up here. So this is the, um, the uh, left limb of the right cruce muscle. It's a limb, and it's a thick fibromuscular structure. And typically right below that is where the feeder vessel is. And if I try to follow that vessel for you, you should see it feed into these big varices. So here, let's go look again. You see the big varices there and you see the feeder is back here. Let's turn off the Doppler because it's distracting. And here you see it's going, the feeders up here. So if, if you just go right into here like this, you can do it, it's fine but you're gonna to have to put a lot of glue in. So I'd like to get it at the root, the feeder root. And so you kind of follow that back. You just pull back. You know you're coming into the esophagus. First of all, you feel it, right? You feel like suddenly it pulls through the GE junction. You feel that, but here you can see the cruise muscle. So now let's get our 19 gauge needle. So and this is where you need to have a good assistant Dr. And, Binmuller, yes, we are just coming back till you are ready with the needle. Now, just to show you once again, so we have here, this is the gastric varices, what you see endoscopically. We follow this like this, and the feeder is up here like this. I can turn it. And back here, these are often large gastrorenal shunts, and we don't want to go. This is These are collaterals. These are outside of uh, the uh, the gastric fundus. You can see the spleen is in the back here, so we don't want to target that. But listen, don't worry. I mean, if you put coils in here, as long as they are appropriately sized, it's not a problem. So I'm going to pull back. I have my assistant who's going to hold my position, and I'm going to target two areas. So here, this is the feeder here. So let me target this space right here. Let's get one coil in there, and then I'm going to push through and put a second coil here. And I just need to wait with respiration for a good moment to thrust forward and target. I've already advanced the sheath out from the elevator. That's already done. And I'm going to look for the echogenic linear line. You can see it right up at the very top here. 
here, there's the needle, right? And now I just have to coordinate this with the respiration because I'd like to have the cruise muscle in between. And I want to target more this part here. All right, so this is where your assistant holding is so critical. Now we can measure the distance here from the tip of the needle. Oops, I pressed the wrong button. It's on the other side here, good. It's the opposite in India. So it's about 2.3 centimeters, right? So I'm gonna dial in from here to a little over two centimeters. So I know that I don't overshoot and I'm screwing in tightly, tightly, and I'm ready now to puncture. So let's just make sure that the trajectory looks correct. And now I'm in, all right? Okay. Now let's wait, wait a second, because I may be alongside, because sometimes it will push the varics. And I think that's in fact exactly what happened here. So let me, I may have to fine tune here a little bit. Okay, turn this way here. Hold it right there, please. Okay. Okay, see it? Now I got a stab like this. Okay. It's fine. I'm inside. You can start to aspirate and you should get blood yeah. return. Cameraman. But if you don't, Focus. then we're not in. Then you can, what you can do then, it could be that the tissue clogged. So this is saline that we're injecting. We're going to inject again some saline. We're obviously in, but it could be that some of the tissue plugged up the lumen. Yeah. It's it clearly in there. You saw the bubbles, right? Okay, now when you aspirate, you should get blood. See blood return? Now we take this off, okay? Unscrew. Now we're going to attach the loader, the coil loader. You'll flush with water. That's correct. This is saline. We're using saline because we're going to inject two octocyanoacrylate afterwards. But first comes our coil. So we've selected a large coil that's 20 millimeters. It's the largest one we have. There it is. It's the Nestor coil from Cook. And they're different coils. Um, the Nestor is fairly floppy, but it has a nice wooly strand, wool strand, fiber, synthetic fibers attached to it. The MRI coil is stiffer. So I'll sometimes actually place the MRI first, like a scaffold for the second coil. And I may put multiple coils in here when you have very large varices. So the number of coils I use depends on the size of the varix. So if the varix is over two centimeters in size, I'll put three, four coils in there. If this varix is one to two centimeters in size, I put two coils. And if this coil, if the varix is between 0.5 and one, then I'll just put one coil inside. All right. So now, as he pushes through, you'll see the coil come out and it's starting to unravel. What's important here is to slowly pull back as it unravels. Are you pushing out? Okay. Usually I see it a little better. There it is. It's starting to unravel there. Yeah. Okay, good. Our first coil is in. Let's put the second coil. Pull this out and we're going to put a second coil immediately. So you need to put a few coils into these very large varices. So now the loader back on, please. Mm -hmm. And he flushes first. Now, technically, you aspirate first, confirm, but you see the bubbles. So it's all good. Yeah. All right, good. Now put the loader back on. So the flushing is just to make sure that the blood is not clogging the needle, right? The blood will easily clog the needle. So you want to always keep it patent. All right. So now what he's doing is using the stylet to push the coil into the FNA needle, the 19 gauge. And once the coil is inside of the needle, then he removes the, lo the loader, right? And then he uses the stylet to push the coil all the way through the length of the FNA needle to deploy it. So it's a little tedious. You need to have an assistant who's tall. I have a short assistant who uh, actually um, has to step on... Um, a stool uh, to have the correct height because you have to be very high up for this. All right, now you can see the second coil should be coming soon. So I'm just holding my position and we should see that one start to come out. Now, you know, the flow in these varices can be really quite vigorous. The second coil is in and 
honestly, I think a third coil would yeah, would be so, appropriate. Yeah. So, but you can see the coils start to fill. The idea is that you really want to have a sufficient scaffold that, that will um, hold the glue in place and prevent it from embolizing, right? You want to avoid systemic embolization of the glue. There's very rapid blood flow in these varices. So and professor? especially when these patients have large gastrorenal shunts. Professor? So we're going to put one more coil in. You come back to me and then I'll show you the glue injection. Yes. There's the cruise muscle. Let's look for the varices. Yeah. There you see the varices, right? There you see the coils that are inside right here. Right. So we're just going to hold this position. And this is where I'm going to first advance the sheath out. Very important. Okay. The sheath is out. Now I'm going to advance the needle out just to sort of see where it's coming out here. There it is at the top. All right. Then I just have to target now where my coils are. So I want to target that spot. Okay, just hold it like this. So the only disadvantage now is I, you know, don't have an, I have a lumen that's filled with coils, but the good news is it's going to hold my, uh, this should be in. So the most important is to aspirate. Okay, aspirate, please. Aspirate to see if you get any blood return. No, we just put the glue in. So let's see if we get some blood return. If not, I have to redirect. Okay, no, no blood return. So if you don't have blood return, you don't want to inject the glue. You never want to inject the glue. That's the only drawback of, uh, I think there, I may be in there. Yeah. Can we flush we, the yeah, you may just, if you flush, you may just get lots of, just aspirate again. Yep. You got blood? Good, good, good. Now I want you to inject the glue here. So you inject it slowly. So the, bu the bubbles should be, you should see the bubbles in there. Their bubbles are there. Okay, and you see it filling the barracks too, right? Okay, so slowly, over 45 seconds, slowly let it drip in. And I realize you don't see it so well because there's lots of coils in there. But just slowly push it in. And it will first fill the dead space. It's about a CC that fills mostly the dead space. You just hold your position. He's just very, very slow. The idea is really to drip in the glue. So it attaches to the coil. And the glue we are using is two octal. This is two octal. So this is different from N-butyl. Now we're going to flush out the glue that's in the dead space into the varix very slowly. And it's going in very slowly. So the idea is we want all of that glue to attach. And when it's fully in, is it in? Okay. It's fully in, right? Yeah. All right. So now what I do is I pull back and I'm going to now advance the sheath out in front of me. You'll see it right there. There's the sheath on EUS and I'm going to pull the scope out completely. So I'm not going to pull the needle out of my working channel because there's a small risk. You could get some glue on the tip, even though there's a balloon on the tip of the transducer. And then you can see here, we have the tip. There's no glue. It looks fine. And then now I just have the assistant wipe that off, and then we can remove the needle. So All right. So we you, remove Professor. it now. Thank you for the 